Now let's talk about the energy outside of things because this is way more complicated. So there's different ways people have broken it down, but essentially you have your, your, your BMR, which is your basal metabolic rate. And what that, that's usually about 50 to 70% of the energy people expend per day. And it, the way I tell it is it's basically the cost of keeping the lights on. And we would determine that if you were putting somebody in a metabolic chamber, I believe that we don't require them to be sleeping, but it's laying up, laying there, but being awake, correct? And that's slightly yep. different from your energy expenditure while sleeping. Yep. And there are some, like you have RMR and you have BMR and there are some mm -hmm. subtle differences between the two, but I mean, essentially it's, it's very similar. Um, I've had my RMR assessed, which is basically you go into a lab, you lay down, they make sure you're stable for 20 minutes. You don't talk, you don't listen to music, you don't do anything. You just sit there and breathe or you lay there and breathe. Um, and I mean, RMR and BMR are going to be very similar. I'm going to simplify it for our audience just because it's an already complicated subject. But um, those are that's basically you, you know the cost of keeping the lights on. So it, it, what, the, what the other way to think about it is if you were in like a coma per se, um, where you're awake, having some brain activity, that sort of thing, um, but you're not you're not moving, you're not physically moving. That's still about fifty to seventy percent of people's total daily energy expenditure, and that's what we refer to, refer to as me metabolic rate. And when you had yours measured, Lane, did you have it done using indirect calorimetry? Yeah. So mine was. When I had it done, I'm anywhere between 1900 and 1950 calories per day, pretty consistently. Tell folks how that works. Cause I think when most people say, I just had my BMR measured, uh, it's usually not the rigorous way that we're talking about using indirect yeah. calorimetry. It's usually relying on heart rate and respiratory rate, which, yeah. you know, can probably give some approximation, but um, it's yeah. probably important for people to understand that there's an enormous error that's introduced when you make that approximation. Yeah. So what's the rigorous way to determine energy expenditure? So direct calorimetry is the most rigorous way. And that is literally, um, you know, Burning. kind of in a bomb calorimeter, <laughs> yeah. right? You're, you're, you're in a metabolic chamber and they are looking at, um, you know, how much heat you're generating essentially. And from that heat that you generate, they're able to determine your total daily energy expenditure and then using an equation based on your oxygen consumption versus your CO2 production, they can determine what from that is your BMR, which is actually the same way they, they do it for indirect, indirect calorimetry. So you're wearing, you're inside this like hood and you're breathing into a tube essentially. And basically your metabolic rate is very closely associated with how much oxygen you consume. So how much oxygen you consume versus how much CO2 you expire will one, give you a really good idea of your metabolic rate because the end products of metabolism are CO2 and water. So, so when everything goes through this process of breaking down carbohydrates and fats, it all, if, if you talk about like what happens to body fat, it ends up as CO2 and water. Okay. So if they know that, and you can use a constant for water, if they know that, it's also why they can use doubly labeled water to estimate energy expenditure. We'll get to that later. Um, but if you know that and you know these constants and you make several assumptions, I mean, again, this isn't direct. You're making assumptions. You're making assumptions about how much is being generated. Um, you can come up with a relatively accurate um, estimation of your uh, metabolic rate. And for reasons that I can't re explain, this is something I can never forget, which is the coefficients for that equation. Uh, the Weir coefficients, right? <laughs> so energy expenditure is 3.94 times VC, VO2 plus 1.11 times VCO2. So as you said, it's heavily weighted to oxygen consumption. It's nearly four times the consumption of oxygen plus about one times the production of carbon dioxide. And that gives you that. And for anybody listening to this who's ever had a VO2 max test, I would encourage you to ask the lab that does it for you to give you the raw data because what they'll spit out for you, usually in 15 second intervals, is VO2, VCO2. And while the purpose of that test might be to determine your maximal VO2, you can also plug in these two variables to the Weir equation and get how many calories per minute you're consuming or requiring to maintain that energy output all the way to your max. It's actually quite remarkable when you consider that a highly trained individual will easily get to 20 calories per minute of energy demand. Yeah. I mean, if you think about, you know, we say lean mass is by far the biggest correlate with 
uh, total daily energy expenditure and, and resting metabolic rate. Um, lean mass requires quite a bit of oxygen uh, compared to like adipose tissue, which is relatively non-vascular. So it makes a lot of sense that you would see that. And then if you think about activity, obviously if you start doing activity, it requires a lot of oxygen. So we have our BMR, which is about in terms of the energy outside of things. And I guess I should define that. Energy out is your total daily energy expenditure. So all the energy you expend in a day, that's your TDEE, we call it. And the biggest portion of that is your BMR for most people. Now, if you're an elite athlete who trains like six, eight hours a day, you can get to the point where your physical activity is actually greater than your BMR. So don't, don't be those listening. Don't be dogmatic about these numbers. But for most people, uh, 50 to 70% is a relatively accurate representation. For me, it's probably about 55 to 60% of my total daily energy expenditure because I do train like two, two and a half hours a day. So that is a significant contributor. So we have that. Then we have what's called TEF, which is the thermic effect of food or diet-induced thermogenesis. And this is anywhere from 5 to 10% of your total daily energy expenditure for most people. Very, very hard to measure. Um, usually it's expressed in terms of you know, calories per minute uh, because they're only looking at it in the short term. And when we do studies of total daily energy expenditure, I mean, usually what they're doing is using a constant for TEF. They're, they're making an assumption because it's just so hard to measure unless you're just measuring that over like the course of a couple of hours or maybe a day at most. But we feel relatively confident based on the, the studies out there that it's about 5 to 10% of your total daily energy expenditure. So not a, not a big contributor. But still. But it also seems to be macronutrient dependent, correct? Do, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So w I, that's one of the things that we'll I'm come back get to that when we get to. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Right. And then if we look at the, kind of the last component, we have our physical activity. And this encompasses all physical activity. So people hear this and they think exercise. But actually, the biggest, for a lot of people, their biggest component of physical activity is actually what's called NEAT, which is non exercise activity thermogenesis. And that is something that's actually extremely modifiable. And we see it in terms of one, people who are obese resistant, what we, what we term obese resistant, they tend to fidget a lot. They tend to move a lot. I was like this as a, as a kid. I still am. Uh, whereas people who are obese prone tend to have very low NEAT. And in fact, there was a study done by Liebel in 1995 where they overfed people by, I want to say, 1,000 calories per day. And they determined this, they, they looked at their total energy expenditure in a metabolic ward, so very accurate. And then they took that number and added 1,000 calories on top of it. And they looked at how much weight people gained. Somebody, some people gained more than they expected. One person did not even have significant weight gain. And what they found was this individual's NEAT, their spontaneous physical activity, went up so much it just co compensated for that, for that extra calories. And so I think this is what people really don't understand as well is we, I want to be very purposeful about how we define NEAT because when it comes to NEAT versus exercise, exercise is purposeful. So something I'll hear a lot is, well, I'm going to go do a walk and get my NEAT up. No, you're doing exercise. <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm being a little bit pedantic, but it's important because NEAT is what I'm talking about. Fidgeting, it's what I'm like with my, like not right now because now I'm thinking about it, but <laughs> like I'm waving my hands around. I'm kind of like, sh you know, moving from one foot to the next. You know, I've seen Peter that like you kind of move your fingers and you'll kind of, you know, twitch your neck. That's what all that stuff, even though it seems like nothing, thousands of those movements over the course of a day actually add up. So then I have people say, well, I'm just going to like tap my foot, you know, to, to get knee up or, or fidget. Well, guess what's going to happen? Whenever you try to do something that also requires your brain, you're going to stop doing that because you actually can't really do two things at once in terms of like thinking about it. So this truly is spontaneous energy expenditure and appears to be modifiable by about five to 600 calories per day. And we do see this with overfeeding and underfeeding. So people who are, and we'll get into talking about metabolic adaptation and how this affects things. But people who lose like 10% of their body weight, they've seen up to a 500 ca calorie reduction in NEAT. So that's a, a big portion of it. And then obviously you have your purposeful exercise. So if we look at energy out or energy in, metabolizable energy, energy out, BMR, TEF, NEAT, and exercise, 
I'm simplifying this equation a little bit, but though that's essentially it. Um, so when people, if people want to invalidate energy balance, what I always say is, listen, you ate those carbons. Something must happen to them. You, you cannot just, they don't flutter off into oblivion and you don't create them out of nothing, right? Something has to happen to them. And we have a lot of metabolic tracer studies to pretty much know what happens to them. I think the confusion becomes, well, I tracked my calories. I ate in a 500 calorie deficit and I didn't lose weight. First off, if we look at where these mistakes come in, people weigh themselves sporadically. And if you only weighed yourself once a week, I would say it's virtually meaningless. Um, when we are trying to get data on people, we're very regimented with how we do it. So it's you weigh in first thing in the morning after voiding, voiding your bladder and bowel, if possible, fasted, first thing you do, as soon as your feet hit the floor after you've gone to the bathroom, you weigh in. And then we take that weight every single day and then we look at the average and then we compare week to week averages. Because anybody who's ever tracked their weight, and I don't know, I'm sure you've had this experience, Peter, where you're, you're eating very consistently, you're tracking your weight, and it'll easily fluctuate by 1% to 2% per day. So if you're 200 pounds, you could be 204, you could be 196. And I always tell people, it's like the stock market. Sometimes there's a good explanation for why it goes up and down like that, but other times there's no good explanation whatsoever. And you don't just want to take like one isolated data point. And this is also with people who get DEXAs done and they go, they freak out because I lost a pound of lean body mass. No, you went and had it done at a different time where you were less hydrated. Or, or on a different machine or with a Absolutely yeah, different software. Absolutely different yeah, tech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, I tell people, I, I don't want to tell them not to get DEXAs done, but unless you're going to do it, same tech, same machine, same conditions, you, it, it's, it, I'm like, cool. It doesn't really mean anything, but you have it. So... When you, look at, when you look at that, so you could have somebody theoretically, and I've, I've shown this example with clients, where I've said, your average weight is down by a pound. But if I had weighed you on this day last week and this day this week, you would think you were up by two and a half pounds. So people will start doing a calorie deficit diet and they'll say, well, see, I gained weight, so this doesn't work. No, that was a fluid shift. From day-to-day -to -day -to -day changes in weight are much more dictated by fluid shifts than they are adipose tissue levels. But your weekly and monthly changes in weight are much more dictated by your actual body mass. So that's one thing that confuses people.